you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to, to talk to, with people from the communities and the governments and, and to also to colleagues uh, from Canada, which I've been, and abroad as a matter of fact, which I've been knowing for quite some time. So oh, my first picture over here is shows in the, the, uh, the terminal building, the actual terminal building of the uh, Iqaluit Airport uh, that is going to be uh, changed. The, uh, the whole airport is going to be uh, reconstructed and uh, resurfaced in the coming years. And they are just like any other, just like any other uh, infra northern infrastructure, it, it faces the challenge of uh, permafrost thawing. But my presentation in overall will, well, add are the broad contents of the presentations. I will just provide a few definitions of what is permafrost and so on, then introduce you to what I call temperature regime 101, what's, what drives permafrost, what, uh, the causes of towing permafrost, the relationship between superficial geology and ground ice, and then I will provide you with an example of uh, a community in northern Quebec. Nunavik is, is not a, a northern, it is a territory of northern Quebec, it's with a different status, but uh, it faces exactly the same challenges as you are over here in Northwest Territories, uh, uh, Nunavut, and uh, Yukon. And uh, we have been involved quite a lot, quite a lot in the same, exactly the same types of problems and challenges uh, that you are over here. And I will show you, if I have time, the example of how we can map community and get communities involved in permafrost mapping. Well, what is permafrost? It is rock or soil that remains below zero degrees for a long period of time, uh, more than two years, much longer in fact. Contains various forms of ice that can be associated with its formation, past climate changes, growth, groundwater migration, erosion, and sedimentation. It supports ecosystems, the land we live on is in the north is on permafrost. It supports man-made infrastructures, and man-made infrastructures have similar effects to the environment, dealing with snow cover, heat exchanges, and so on. Uh, knowledge, of, knowledge of permafrost properties is very important uh, for engineering purposes and for uh, understanding the land processes uh, that, are, that will be discussed today and, uh, in the last, and also in the next two or three days. Well, Canada is really a permafrost country. You see, the, the sort, this is the southern limit of discontinuous permafrost over here, and the line between the blue and the purple over here is the limit of the, between the discontinuous and the continuous permafrost. All that is part of Canada, more than 50% is underlined by permafrost. So ground that is below zero, uh, that, and also that very often contains most, most of the time contains ice. And as some other presentations of, are coming up, for example, with Steve will show you, we discover more and more ice all the time in the permafrost. In fact, there is more ice than we, tend, we used to, to believe 20 years ago. We keep finding it, uh, particularly, particularly as, as, it, as it does. This map of uh, North America, compiled uh, by uh, Sharon Smith and colleagues, shows, well, places where you have uh, temp uh, ice, uh, thermistor cables in the ground uh, across Canada. Uh, there are quite a number, uh, for example, along the, uh, the pipeline in, in, the, in, w in Western Canada, up to and there are a few, uh, uh, a few elsewhere across the country. Alaska has got a much, more number, a much larger number. And you see this, these, uh, the color over here represents the, the, the temperature of the ground at the top of the permafrost. And what you can see is that uh, uh, in the red, you already have uh, above zero degree temperature since permafrost has disappeared, always quickly disappearing. It's now deeper in the ground. And, and as we go further north, well, going northward with the climate, we get colder and, and colder climate and colder and colder ground and permafrost. For example, if you take uh, on the eastern can Canada from Nunavik to Nunavut, from, uh, let's, uh, let's see, oh, this site over here, it's called Umiak, it's on the eastern coast of Hudson's Bay, used to have permafrost, uh, an active layer about 10 meters thick, now it's down to 20 meters. 
And, and these are the, those profiles show the mean and rose ground temperature in the ground at best, up to 16 or 20 meters deep. And you can see that the permafrost temperature gets colder and colder as we move northward. So over here, we go northward across northern Quebec Peninsula, and then we, we jump onto uh, Baffin Island and Elsmoy Island and, ba and, and so on, and we get to the northern, northern tip of Canada where permafrost temperatures are, are still in the minus uh, 14 range. 14 degrees. But even at those places, you can see evidence. For example, if you take this profile over here, you see the recent, the impact of recent warming in, in the near surface permafrost. Permafrost is warming everywhere, and in a large part of the country, it's now at my between zero degree and minus two on the verge of uh, thawing. We can discuss that because it's a, whole, it's a whole field of research by itself. Permafrost thawing and the dynamics of thawing and the thermodynamics of towing. But let's get back just to the basics so that we can talk, everybody can talk the same language today, on the same, understand the same things. Permafrost is defined by temperature. So you get uh, the temperature profile. You need MEST on top of the grass means mean annual surface temperature. In order to have permafrost, you have to have the ground surface temperature below zero degree or maximum zero degree. Few exceptions in the literature, but basically this is it. And then uh, you have a little bit of heat flow coming from deep in the earth, and between the two you, you have a gradient of temperature. And in the winter, the su that's, this is the surface, the ground surface over here, that, and you get negative temperatures, cold temperature at the surface. The, the, you have minimum temperatures that, that develop into the permafrost, into the ground. In the summer, you have the reverse situation, and y the surface of the soil has above surface temperatures, which initiates thawing of the from the surface, which we call the active layer of the permafrost. And the active layer, uh, you, you, you s the base of the active layer is, or the top of the permafrost, is where you have the deepest uh, zero degree temperature value. The, we call it the isotherm uh, at the end of the summer in the ground. But what happens if we warm the ground, if we warm the climate? Let's see, those, two, those three uh, short arrows over here indicate a warming by, uh, by some degrees. Surface warming can take place by just, you warm the air, you warm the climate, you will warm the ground. You increase the snow cover by some means, along a roadside, for example, or, or vegetation grows and it caps snow, it captures snow and the snow, snow banks increase. Surface of the ground increases temperature of the surface increases. Or you build something in it. You build a building and it, the heat of the building goes into the ground. You warm up the ground. Then what happens underneath? The, the temperature profiles move towards or the warmer values. And what, what you see that happens when it does is that the, the depth of the zero degree isotherm at maximum temperature gets deeper. Means active layer gets deeper. And if we, and Active layer gets deeper, we, we melt the ice in the ground. And then with, with time, the permafrost warms up again and again, eventually will become close to zero degree, called isothermal. The profile almost equal to zero all the way down, eventually will, will top. This is what occurs. For example, you have a picture, and right? it's just permafrost uh, active with the, an active layer over here and you have the tundra on top. This represents the snow. It's poor representation, the snow cover in winter. Uh, the active layer is over here. This is the permafrost. It's ice rich over here. It's fine grain, ice rich permafrost. Permafrost has got properties like uh, uh, density, thermal conductivity, uh, diffusivities, and so on, uh, ice and water content. The active layer gets deeper in the permafrost. This ice will top in the ground. What does happen? Well. Like this, you see, you have a core of permafrost here, over here, in, in the tube, in the, in the glass tube, I've before freezing, before thawing, after thawing. So imagine the impact on the terrain. Imagine the land, the, the, the surface of the soil settling down, water ex getting expelled from the thaw, from the melting of the ice, uh, poor drainage conditions getting involved, loss the loss of building capacities for buildings, construction, or for the ecosystem as a matter of fact. A total dramatic changes in the environment. So, and we are facing the climate warming. The climate has already begun to, war to warm 
I, we won't go into detail over here. It's well known. You feel it. You, and the, these are some just one of many of the projections. This one is from the uh, ACIA report 2005. Uh, we see that the climate is going to warm again and again, particularly in winter by several degrees uh, in the north. Well, what happens to the ice? And what type of ice do we have in the ground? For example, just a few, I will show you just a few examples. You have over here an ice wedge underneath the sides of tundra polygons. Uh, that's on, uh, in the high Arctic, on Violet Island. Or you have those uh, Litalsas or uh, permafrost mounds, let's see, in, in Clee, in northern Quebec, in discontinuous permafrost. All the lakes and uh, the, the shrubland over there are no, non-permafrost. It's really patchy. It's discontinuous. And you have a core from one of those uh, permafrost mounds. You see, it's very ice-rich uh, clay. So, and you have formed landforms that were well known across everywhere in the world and, and the circumpolar <laughs> world and possibly northern Canada, like Palsas in peatlands. And you have a core in the peat over here. You see ice lenses in the, in the mineralized peats. Features like frost boils that you have that are very good indicator of the of presence of an important amount of ground ice. So all these features, many people in the north, they already know th their existence. They know the landforms. Uh, the uh, indigenous peoples work over the, the, the terrain. They, they walk across over here. And what we are trying now is to, uh, to train people to use those diagnostic landforms to help understand how much ice there is in the ground and to help map and, uh, their territory. Uh, for uh, land use planning. Uh, tundra polygons, ice wedges, again, and just an idea how we can map ice in the ground. For example, over here, it's a ground penetrating radar profile where we can detect over here the, the, ice, the ice wedges. This, we see this wedge lengthwise uh, over there, like this, and this is a single wedge over here. It's a little, little, quite an amount of ground ice over here. We, we see the sedimentary layers in the in the, the low center polygon. But a lot of things can be done with geophysics. It's just an example of the use of geophysics. Examples of impacts of thawing permafrost. Landslides. Uh, Steve is going to talk, make a, a presentation. You will see huge landslides. This is a small one in Salouit, northern Quebec. It's active, just the active layer. It's an active layer slide. The, th the depth of thawing that summer, uh, 2010, got deeper than usual. It melt the, the ice at at the thawing interface generates water, water pressure, and the, s the ice underneath makes a perfect slip surface and generate a, a slide on the slope. You have lakes forming where permafrost disappears. You have, uh, for example, you can see over here various permafrost mounds at, the at different, different stages of being uh, of thawing and being replaced by lakes. Uh, over here, a thermal erosion. That in Pangirtung, the erosion of permafrost by the river created terrain subsidence. And you have, well, in the north, it's well known, you know, poorly designed buildings can have, can transfer heat into the ground underneath. And you can see over here, this building is sagging a little bit because the permafrost has been towing. All, all problems that are being faced and challenge that are being faced by communities everywhere. Uh, and active layer slides. For example, this active layer slide in 1998 in uh, created a panic uh, the, and the community started to move houses uh, in this uh, new division. Uh, again, in 2010, in the same area, they, they had to be fixed. And now I will just introduce uh, how we can work with the community or just uh, what I want to do is share my exper an experience with the community. And Salwit is located in northern Quebec. It's the one of the northernmost uh, community. And you see it's, it's on a fjord. It's on a Suglut fjord. And it's, this is Oxon Street uh, over there. And what is the, the problem? How can we s just summarize the problem of the community? It's in, it's in a valley bottom. It's, it's bounded by steep valley slopes, valley slides. No place to expand. The ground in the valley bottom is high, very ice rich. Population is increasing, like, uh, like anywhere, everywhere else in the Arctic. There is a, a lar very important need for housing. Uh, and housing also means construction, means opening new streets, means expanding the, the area of the community, means, uh, and 
At the same time, we have this warming of the climate that is, that is taking place, and we have those landslides that are occurring and the cost settlement of the ground. The, the, the ground in town settled by 15 centimeters over the last six centuries, over the last uh, 25 years. So construction, buildings, uh, well, they were not, they, rather, they were rather well designed, as a matter of fact, but there were some adjustments, and adaptation is, is really necessary. So, so the work that was done is, and I want to stress things that we probably will come back again in the, com in the presentations over the next two, three days. It's very, the first step is always, in my opinion, to understand superficial geology, the, 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 the soils at the surface. Because as, as I just mentioned in a glimpse, there is a direct relationship between the, the soil type and the, the, the amount and the type of ice that you have in the ground. It's the first step in mapping. Then you can map ground ice. For example, the darker the blue over here, the, the, the larger the amount of ice in the ground. And then you can go further and you can map, you can devise a map using a GIS application uh, for construction you know, based on sediment types, the, th the depth of the sediments or the soils to the bedrock, ice content, slopes, evidence of uh, occurring instabilities and surface drainage. And after a lot of community consultation and participation, it took, it took, it's a project that took about 10 years to, to evolve. To evolve uh, the community came out with, a solu with its own solution, own, in fact, made its own decision. And for example, the white areas now are the new developing terrain for the, uh, for the community. And uh, for example, the, they are now expanding uh, in this area with, a, with uh, appropriate uh, design for, and this is the new development area, so the coming development area for the community on top of, a, of the slope on bedrock mostly, and the government now is about to open a new road over here in order to, to, to provide access to the expanding community. If we look at that in two dimensions or along a profile, you can see this is the, the ice rich clay over here, this is the bedrock, the brown is the glacial material, is still. So now, gradually, as well, we adapt the construction over here for in the existing villages, but gradually the village with new construction and will be moving upwards on the hill on, on bedrock and uh, will be built over here and probably also we are planning to change, uh, the build more houses on piles to adapt them to uh, on, on more solid ground. And th this is an example of the decision. And very important, the cultural aspect of it, what pleases most of the, peop of the people is that from where on that, build on that hill, they will keep seeing the sea uh, because they, they are a very uh, coastal people and they will have uh, access to the, to the, to the sea. When, when we map a village, we, we start with, uh, for example, with uh, uh, air photographs or mosaic. Uh, this, uh, this one is a satellite picture. This is Provence Netouk in Nunavik. And then you map the surface geology. From the surface, uh, and now we are mapping all the communities. Uh, we have 13 communities on permafrost in Nunavik. And we are in the process of mapping all of them in collaboration with the regional government and the communities. Uh, the, the, you need field work. The, the green dots over there are control points or survey points in, in the field, including just observations, digging pits, uh, uh, using backhoes for making excavations, shallow drilling, extracting cores, and everything like this. And then it is supported by laboratory work. We, we we use X-ray to determine how much ice there is in the ground. We make tests are made and so on. Eventually, uh, we a GIS application. I, I run fast because it's technical. To b you, you produce a ground ice map. Eventually, we use con permafrost conditions, slope, co constraints, and uh, we provide a map for construction. So for example, terrain manageable for construction, uh, restricted with only certain types of foundations, uh, unfavorable for construction, and so on. And finally, you revisit the community, present, discuss results, provide support. And I will, I will insist, monitoring temperature, monitoring permafrost, monitoring processes, and it's a very good way to have uh, community people involved and participating because 
they can take charge. They can, and it's very important also to to teach, to improve the, the the technical or the general education level, for example, in schools and with community members, so that they can make use of the maps. Uh, the kids, the younger people, the students, they are very good with GIS, with computers, with photographs, and they are very, very keen in uh, learning how to monitor ground temperature and eventually take control of their, the, the, the future of their community uh, by uh, knowing better the permafrost conditions. I thank you very much, and I thank you to all the organizations that have been supporting us over the time.